I'm here on behalf of the Native Seed Foundation. And uh, first I'll dive into me a little bit, and then I'll dive into the company a little bit. Then I'll talk about why gathering seeds, and then I'll dive into the more practical elements of it. Uh, I'm gonna try and talk a, lot, a little fast because there's a lot of material that I wanna cover. Uh, if you have a question, uh, write it down and keep it, put it in your back pocket, and then at the end we'll make sure that there's enough time to look over them. Uh, initially, could I get like just a quick survey of what people's intentions or what they want to learn through this process is? What are people curious about? Gathering native seeds? Yeah. Is that? <laughs> All right. <laughs> you want to be propagating? The long or the short answer of that is plant and fall. Spread seeds and fall and let nature do the take its course. Each one has very specific requirements, but generally is going to be cold stratification, which means a lot of cold and warm. The other right, freeze and thaw. Okay. I, we probably won't have time to get into that, but there is a list on the back of that document I gave you that does refer to some of the more medicinal ones and uh, gives you a springboard to look into further research. So uh, basically, plants saved my life. That's how I got into it. I lost my father to suicide when I was uh, younger, and I felt like I was just spinning in the public school system. The second I got out, I hopped into Yellowstone, and I started doing trail crew there. And that was very empowering. And there was, uh, initially I was caught by the inspiration of everything I see, and just like the magnanimity of it, just the cycles of death and life woven into each other and the complexity of it. And um, there was a specific experience where I realized that everything I needed to survive in that landscape, I was carrying on my back from outside of that landscape. And that was a real uh, learning lesson for me. Because from that point, I started asking, how can I meet my needs from this landscape itself? And I think that's an important question for us to address as individuals, particularly at this time in the planet. Um, so I started on that journey at that moment. And I started uh, studying agroecology ecology applied to agricultural systems, and then I started studying indigenous management of landscapes, and I started uh, studying ecology and resource development, uh, resource management, and I kind of tried to blend those all, and within that I would find individual teachers who I thought were specialized in particular fields, whether it's Rod McGeever, with, who is doing the apples today, whether it's a guy named Dale Cooley who lived in the, uh, the bush of Hawaii, and lived in abandoned uh, villages, or whether it was Mark Vandermeer of Watershed Consulting, who, who has done more on the ground uh, restoration activities than anyone else I've known in this region. So I, I would join them and I'd pick their brains and I'd try and put it all into a pile. My original calling to come into the Native Seed Foundation is looking for a, a, a practical and economically viable way to integrate myself into the broader landscape. I think most of us experience the landscape as scenery, and that's important for us to transcend. How can we become participants rather than have it be something we look at? And I think this is a very good and practical way to be able to facilitate the rejuvenation of our planet while integrating ourselves into the landscapes that support all that we know. So that was kind of my piece, uh, where I'm coming from, why it matters to me. And the Native Seed Foundation was started 35 years ago uh, by washing berries in a screen box in a creek in the woods. And it has evolved since then. It was my mentor, David Roniger, was taught by uh, John Lawyer. Uh, some of you may have heard of Lawyer's Nursery. This is the, the second generation keeper of that. So he started having David Roniger grab some uh, seeds from him from the bush. And it just grew and grew and grew. And um, the need and the focus on uh, restoration within the forest economy evolved and uh, the demand has evolved with it. Um, so uh, everyone wants to come here learning how to gather. The first thing is confidence. You know, that's a big part of it and it's hard to get that confidence right out the gate because nature, there are no guarantees in nature. Nature is full of ups and downs and uh, you can't always be confident in provisions. But the main thing is getting out there and getting field experience, developing your knowledge, getting, developing your ability to look at landscapes and notice the textures or the subtle hues, and that those become your indicators where plants are. Because how do you identify plants in the hills 35 miles away 
You're not going to do it by leaf shape or, or the lenticels on the branch. You have to look for those subtle things, the hues and the textures primarily. So that's a valuable thing to learn, and that only comes from experience. I could never, I could never pass that on here. Um, scouting is a big part of it, and, and so it's kind of a hard thing to just hop into gathering seeds. You already have to be integrated a little bit, or else you have to be willing to utilize it as a hobby for some time, and then let it become something that's more of a, a mainstay. Uh, but if you know the landscapes, then you already have some ideas of where some patches are. To make it work, you have to be very aware of timing, which is an art. Uh, for example, balsam root will first come on in the Columbia and Snake River, and that'll be, be about a week and a half ahead of us. And then the next, uh, around the, um, the Flathead River and the Clark Fork, those will come on next. And then you move up and in the Flathead area and up near Libby is starting to come on. And then up near uh, Shoto and the Rocky Mountain Front is starting to come on. And those are all staggered by about a week or so. And that's the general phasing, right? You can pretty much count on that uh, uh, order for most of these species. But within that, there's variations. Thanks for trying, Mom. <laughs> Thanks. And I want to say that she is one of the main reasons why I do this, because I know that every single one of these seeds that hits the ground is an infinite amount of possibilities, particularly in regenerating the atmosphere and the soil. And if, if, if we're not planting for the future, then why are we even doing this? You know, I've planted walnut trees, and I'm pretty young, so I have the hope of harvesting, but pay it forward. Um, so anyways... So scouting is a really big, important part of this, and it can be very challenging. You've got to be aware of uh, timing, and, and that goes from region to region. But there's also microclimates within a region. For example, there's a slope where we like to harvest balsam root. And on that slope, there's a, everything staggered slightly. At the bottom uh, is, is the last to come on, and that's because where the cool air settles. The first to come on is up on the more steeper slope. It's got a more direct angle from the low sun at that time of year. It's got the rocks to store the heat, and the wind is kind of going over it so it can push over the mountain, so that's not, that's not drying it off. Uh, so that's, that's or sorry, it's the other way. It's really exposed, so that drying makes it want to produce its seed in the window that it has. And then there's below there where it's a little less steep, but not in the valley bottom. So that's not subject to the cold, but it's not getting as much uh, direct sunlight as up here. So that comes on second, and then at the very bottom comes on third. So if you want to prolong your harvesting window, which if you're doing this for money, you always do, because if you've taken the time to find a site, you want to get everything that you can ethically within your, within your, with the ecosystem's boundaries that you can within that window. So you have to learn how to maximize it. Being able to read those microclimates is critical. That's a, a huge advantage. Also, when it comes to scouting, one of the most uh, advantageous times to do it is late April and, and May. Anyone guess why? Two main reasons. Throw it out there. Snow melt. Did someone say smell? Snow melt. Snow melt. Um, the two main things is not picking season. What? I was Close. Flowers. So flowers are, are designed to be vibrant. They're designed to catch attention. So you got to utilize that. And you look for flowers. And you mark that on your map and you take note. That's also not a picking time. So you're not going to be doing picking then. So it's just like you don't do your scouting during hunting season. Do your scouting in the time before. So you're not wasting hunting season looking. Same thing. Take full advantage of early spring when the flowers are out to identify places. I've found many choke cherry patches by the smell alone. They have a, a smell that wafts a long way. Um, so that's another critical piece. Let me look here. Other elements of it. Oh, know your plants. Uh, I, I keep uh, roadside geology of Montana in my car. Um, and you can that'll help you to a degree because you can get an idea. Uh, so what's a good example? The boulder batholith, the big stony batholith that's going along the continental divide from Helena to south of Butte. Uh, you know that in environments like that, you're probably going to find Schipertia argentia because it likes to grow in rocks like that. Um, what's another good example? Uh, lime. Uh, 
uh, bear grass likes to grow in areas that are often have lime. So in, in a lot of situations, that'll be at the tops of mountains where those really old stones are exposed. So that's a, a good way. So that geology can help. Not super helpful until you get really into it. But know your plants. Know your needs. Know, uh, know what kind of conditions these plants want to grow in. And then you can make uh, uh, informed predictions about where they're likely to occur. A good example is uh, red osier dogwood. It likes open sunlight, and it likes abundant water. So where's the likely place of finding it? Edge of a river, exactly. And wild rose uh, likes to dry out when it's uh, uh, finishing its seed, but it likes to be moist uh, when it's initiating growth in the beginning of the season. So you can use that, and you can... You can say, all right, where's a place that's going to dry out, that's going to have abundant water, but will dry out? And usually the fringe of riparian zones is a good good place for that. Or else if you're looking at like the sloughs uh, um, from the Flathead River, right, those, a lot of those sloughs will kind of, their water level will drop as the water table in the season drops. So around those, you will often find that, right? So know your plants. Service berries, service berries, um, they like to tap into water reserves. So uh, you'll find good service berry crops, and they like uh, sun exposure and warmth. And so you'll, you'll find good service berry crops, say, at the bases of cliffs, uh, where that water is bound to collect. You'll find good service berry crops uh, on the fringes of forests, where they are getting the forest buffering effects that help maintain some of the moisture within the ecosystem, but they're still able to uh, uh, gather full sunlight. And you'll find service berries throughout the forest, there's no doubt there, but the fruiting is, is basically what we're talking about because we're looking for the seed. Um, so get in that mindset, really uh, uh, cultivate a sense of uh, ecologic uh, empathy, ecologic empathy, and, and see from the perspective of that plant, which means knowing about that plant. You can't see from the perspective of that plant unless you understand its needs. So that know your plants, know their needs, and uh, make informed predictions accordingly. Um, okay, and then I think on this, where is it? I give you a, a rundown on that a little bit. Uh, patch locations. So in there, you there's a consolidated list of some of those some of those needs. And that's that's a lot of learning curve. Um, handed there right to you. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a very valuable tool. What's that? I have abundant. Can we get this? And then you need one. Oh, you got the other side of his. Yep. I thought I was missing something. Thank you so much. Yep. So... Let's see how we do on time. I want to. I want to. What's that? Oh, I want to dive into the why a little bit. I think it's important that um, the practical elements are going to come out of experience, and I can hand off some of that right now. The majority of what I can hand off is through the equipment and the process for each individual species. But I think the why is really important. I don't think we spend enough time asking why. We can put a lot of energy into something, but if we're not aligned with the why, then it's basically inconsequential, or we're not going to have the drive or the inspiration to really do our best at it. And, and this, to do your best at it, focus. Focus is key. And if, you, if, you, if you're inspired by it, if you're touched by it, if you know the value of it, then that's going to burn the fire behind your focus and help you be effective. So in terms of some of the whys, I don't think it's any. Uh, I don't think it's any mystery that the ecosystems that are pervasive in our region are pretty dilapidated. There's the soil organic matter is at an all-time low. The density for most of these species is is incredibly high, and so it's prone to. There's too many individuals fighting for similar nutrients, similar resources, so it makes them weak, prone to prone to disease, uh, prone to not having enough water. Uh, not enough air moving in there, so spores and whatnot can establish themselves. Pretty rough state. Um, and basically, plants provide a biological solution that is self-perpetuating. You put plants in an ecosystem, and there's so many different avenues of ripples that affect that ecosystem. Uh, 
and I like to think of it just in terms of elements, uh, water, air, uh, light, right? So if you have, for example, let's talk about carbon. Carbon in the soil, if you have a grassland or a, um, uh, a dense forest, the carbon that is being released from that soil from the decomposition processes is going to be caught by only a couple species as it floats on into the atmosphere. But if you think of layers, if you have staggered species, every time it comes into a species, it's going to suck up a little more. So if you have ground cover, it's going to hit it once. Then you have a balsam growing above it, it's going to hit it again. If you have a shrub growing above it, it's going to catch more of that carbon. If you have a forest cabiny, cap canopy, it's going to catch more of that carbon. Right? So just think of that as a kind of principle. How many times can you catch these resources within an ecosystem? Eco uh, resources like carbon, resources like water, uh, resources like light. You don't want light to reach the soil. It's going to fry the bacteria. It's going to fry the microbes. So how many layers of, of leaves can we put in between the sunlight and the ground? How can we maximize that potential energy entering into the ecosystem? One of the most productive ecosystems known is a savanna. A savanna is basically a hybrid between trees and forbs in a semi-open system. We have this mythology of the wilderness, right? Colonials came here and they thought it's so open, it's so abundant. And uh, that, was, that was, in most situations, a result of the primary keystone species, which were people. Savannas are highly productive because there is that diversity. There is that staggered use of resources. But typically, savannas will not uh, are not a climax setup. Things tend to climax towards grassland if they're more dry, or a forest if they're a little more moist. But it's through interactive management that they're maintained as a savanna. These species and our hands can help maintain and establish savannas, which are going to capture moisture more effectively, which are going to shade the soil more effectively, which are going to retain humidity within the ecosystem more effectively. If you're re retaining humidity in our ecosystem, in our region, that's almost just as effective as adding water to the system because it's the drying effect of dry air that, that is really harmful or it can cause hardships to plants. You can have the same amount of water, but if you're in a dry atmosphere, it's going to disappear quick. But if you're in a more humid situation, it's going to dry out less quick. So having leaves, having canopy that block wind, that block light, that's really going to uh, improve your ability to maintain humidity in the system. Um, a friend of mine said, restoration is a questionable concept. Restoring, what are you going to restore it to? What are you restoring that ecosystem to? That's an important question. In most situations, you're trying to restore that ecosystem to conditions that do not exist. You're trying to restore it to, to lands, landscape use that doesn't exist anymore. You're trying to uh, uh, restore it to conditions that don't exist because there's presence of pests or whatnot that weren't there before. There's species that weren't there before. So restoration recreating that story is a questionable strategy. Maybe a more preferable strategy is resilience, creating something that can withstand the, the tumultuous times of climate, that can uh, withstand the, the limited amount of soil organic matter, that can survive the, the limited amount of rain. So resilience, can this, can this handle disturbance? And is it going to meet the resource demands that populations are looking for today? So I would say that that is a better metric for how we manage our systems. Um, just something to consider. <sighs> OK. I'm going to dive into the equipment now. So this is, this is probably your most important piece of equipment. <laughs> bears like berries have it. I, I was kind of arrogant for a long time. I didn't think it was necessary. I think it's necessary. Um, this is kind of, this is more, my more dweeby side. I like to, I like to, when I'm out here, I'm basically doing a lot of monitoring. I'm, I'm looking at patch well-being. I'm looking at uh, climatic conditions. Is, is this season happening earlier than last season? And how is the temperature different? And, and so I'm taking notes on things like that. Uh, that's not necessary, but it's very fulfilling. And if people take notes like that, we definitely uh, provide incentives to, to gather those. Uh, at a certain point down the road, road, basically, we hope to enable a bunch of citizen scientists to help track uh, the way that climate is changing within these systems. And people on the ground looking at these is one of the best ways to see that. Uh, compass, I, a lot of times, you're going off trail. I mean, always, basically, you're going off trail. Granted, you want to stay close to your car, because usually you're doing such large volume that you want to be able to transfer it to your car. But uh, it's just helpful to have this navigation. 
Uh, a loop. I like to do botany while I'm out there. I'm, I'm not only out there uh, for economic means, I'm out there to learn. So I'm teaching myself botany when I'm in the field. Tom L. Pell, Botany in a Day is down on the list. Uh, one of the best botany books ever, so a magnifying glass. This one is important for uh, lupin. Uh, what is the la lady call me? A Hungarian bread knife is what she called it. I call it a lavender knife. Um, so this or this, uh, these are for like cutting twine or for grapefruit. Uh, when you're harvesting lupin, uh, you basically cut off this, the flowering stalks. And so this just helps you to be efficient. Shoop, 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 stuff. Shoop, 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 stuff. Or same with this. I'll actually put one of these on each hand and I'm plucking and pulling at the same time. So that's a valuable instrument for doing, for doing lupin. And lupin is uh, in the same category as balsam root. It's a very deep taprooting plant that is able to establish itself on dry, open, exposed sites. So it's used a lot for mining reclamation, which is very valuable. And it's putting nitrogen into the soil. So it's basically taking a rare mineral that is critical to cell function and putting it into the system that basically only otherwise comes from lightning and rain. Um, pruners, you don't use these often. About the only time that I use these is with elderberries. Elderberries are a very easy one to pick. Uh, you take whatever grabber you're doing and you bring it down and you can, uh, I'll usually just throw a tarp on the ground for elderberries and I'll bring down the branch and I'll just snip off the clumps and we just take it the whole clump. We'll separate the stems from the berries. You don't need to separate the stems from the berries yourself. They are. And uh, you can you can put a, a cheap way to do that is you can put a bicycle hanger on uh, a, uh, a handle and it'll achieve it. but we're also entering into the manufacturing of these, so these will be available if anyone is interested. And I'll dive into that more. 90% uh, of the time, I'm picking with gloves. I go back and forth on which ones I want. I want them for different reasons, but these are the two that I, uh, two styles that I like the most. Unless I'm doing rose hips, uh, then I'm using welder gloves. <laughs> so these are nice when you're um, when you're stripping because uh, they're sleek. They yeah, they don't snag. The knit will snag on branches and whatnot. So if I'm hand stripping, I'm always using these. If I'm doing other stuff, I'm generally using these. It allows your hands to breathe and uh, still protects them. So those are critical pieces to have. And this is a device, and again, we make these available. This is for picking flowers, uh, specifically balsam root. And these are all devices that have, have been highly refined over a long time. So this is a lot of experience coming to the table right here. Uh, the angle is important. You can see how they go slightly upwards. When you're going through picking the balsam, uh, you swoop and you pluck, and then the angle allows it to drop into the bag. And I'll actually walk through with two of these, and it's, it's a mindfulness game. You know, you're breathing, you're focusing on your breathing, you're making sure your back is in a good position, because otherwise you'll slow, you'll, you'll, you won't last long. You're paying attention, oh, that, those seeds don't look immature, I'm going to skip around them. These ones, the balsam root, uh, the heavy ones of seed will droop down to the bottom. So getting the fringes of the plant where the flower heads are falling, that's where you're going to get the densest, most mature seed. Uh, so I can't emphasize the importance of mindfulness and attentiveness at, that's that's what it's all about. And otherwise you'll get pretty, I mean, if you're doing something where you're out there for, you know, three weeks picking the same plant, um, if you don't have that, then you're, you're probably just gonna be zoning out. And if you're zoning out, you're probably gonna be, um, you're, yeah, you're probably gonna be causing more abuse than necessary. You know, be attentive and, and be considerate of these things. It's, it's, these are nourishing your pockets. These are nourishing the landscape. These are nourishing the birds. We're not just going in there and, and taking what we can get so we can turn it into pennies. And sometimes I'll enter into that. Like a couple of years ago when I was har harvesting balsam, I was sitting there doing the math. And I'm like, okay, every, every flower I pick is a penny. Every flower. And, and when you get in that mind state, you're probably not going to have insights about the ecosystem dynamics, which in my, is my favorite thing about it. I love having revelations about this environment that I'm interacting with. And if you're, if you're one track like that, chances are you're not going to experience those. Um, and you're just going to be harmful to it. And the nice thing about mostly what we focus on is shrubs and, and 
in general, plants make seeds to be distributed. So you're not going to do much harm to the plant by harvesting the seeds. They're meant to be dispersed, right? Uh, and shrubs, they have so much, um, they're so rooted in and there's so much stored energy within their root systems that taking the seeds isn't, isn't a problem for them. Uh, when you get into things where you're using, say, a tennis racket to beat the bushes, I, I leave this on because if I take if I take off the cover, then the metal faces start to scratch the bark. And the reality is it's probably not that consequential, but you don't know. And if I have the choice to be more ethical and more considerate of these plants, why wouldn't I make that? I'm out there to help heal these systems, not to add more damage to them. Uh, typically, I, I won't pick at the end of a patch or at the, the edge of a patch because uh, that's where it wants to spread. That's where the seed is most likely to establish itself and distribute itself. So I focus on the core where it's already established. You've got old plants that are probably going to provide more seed anyways. Uh, so that's a good little, little tip. Um, with huckleberries, a lot of times, if it's really good, I'll, I'll bring this with me. And this is a nice, because it's got that stool. So you can just sit there and work on it. Another one I'll use this on is uh, bunchberry dogwood, which is a ground cover. And I'll also use it on kinikinik, uh, which is another ground cover. Uh, I, I'm, my body is not designed for this work if it's, if it's Forbes, right? I like the shrubs. <laughs> and so I'll use this to help me there. Uh, let's see. And so this, this, uh, this is an important piece. And it doesn't necessarily have to look like this. This is the one that I've, I've had made. Uh, just to make it easier. But the basic principle here is that you have something wide and broad that you can uh, pick into. And if you are having, say if you have these tiny buckets on the side of your, uh, side of your hips, you're gonna spend a lot of time reaching to find it and making sure you don't drop your berries, right? So how can you shorten the time in between plucking and placing? And uh, I, I shorten it by getting rid of it. You know, you can just and pick it and drop it, drop it right in. Uh, so this is something that we've designed to enable that. Uh, what a lot of our pickers will do is they will just take plastic totes and they'll tie them to their waist and tie them around their neck. I don't like walking around with a plastic bin in the woods. It's clunky. Uh, so we got this, and there's this hole in the middle, and you can plop it into there and scoop it into the hole. And then uh, when you're ready to dump them out, you go to your central bin, and you just open that up over it, and you can empty your berries and keep on going. And and you are your own bosses out there. You are your own distinct entities, and we're just technically buying seed from you. And that being said, you're your own leader. You're, the innovation is in your hands. The strategies are in your hands. You're being challenged by the environment and the, the environmental um, industry's need for seeds. You're being challenged by those to improve the process, improve the efficiency, improve your uh, scouting capacities. So whatever you can do to um, just make it go smoother, it pays off, you know? It, you don't make, you make money penny by penny. That's, that's a million little decisions. That's a million points of focus stacked up. So if you're, if you're waking up after sleeping in real late and you're, you're, not, you're not on the ball, you're every, you know, maybe one out of five point of focus choice is going to be sloppy. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, but then by the end of the day, you know, that's one third of your choices were sloppy and kind of careless. So being able to keep that mindfulness and that attentiveness throughout the process when you're stacking all these little choices on, each top, or on top of each other, it really pays off in the long term. And so that same thing applies to your process. If I can cut this out, dropping over here a thousand times, then that might be 30 more minutes of picking. And when you're out there for two weeks at a time, 30 more minutes a day, 
30 times 14 equals a big number. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, innovation is key. Refine it. Uh, you're always working in different settings, so you got to be able to be adaptable. We designed this one so that it can actually get smaller or bigger depending on what you're working in. You know, so if you're just working in open, open service berry, this is the way to do it. If you're working in a little huckleberry, you know, this is the way to do it. So that's that's very important. Um, uh, sell them. There, there's a lot of people making the effort to grow them, and some people are making successes. And then we uh, drink a lot of juice. You have to juice the huckleberry. Yep, that's and we do end up selling huckleberries too. But yeah, there's a lot of people attempting cultivation, and we don't know anyone else who's doing huckleberry seed. So, not a. Yeah, they're finding you can. Mycorrhizal association is key in buffering them from uh, freezing temperature fluctuations. They can handle cold. They're designed for cold, but the fluctuations are fine and causing harm. And those are just kind of theories at this point, but there's enough successes to make them seem kind of valid. So when you're working, um, you want to be efficient and try and make sure that you get everything you can while working within the provisions of the ecosystems. You don't want to take it all. Like I said, leave the stuff on the edges of the patches. And typically what I'll do is I'll make sure that, um, say I'm doing a pass like a, a tractor. Say I'll do three. I'll skip the next one, right? So then I'll go four feet over and then I'll do it. All right, just to make sure you're not getting it all, or I'll hit three bushes and I'll skip that one. Ooh, that one has a lot. I'll skip the next one. You know, <laughs> like that happens, and that's okay. <laughs> um, hmm. So, a lot of times, what I'll do is I'll work in a. Uh, the spider webs are good teachers. Uh, I'll work like a spider web. So I'll be in a region and I'll spiral around my central bin. You always got a central bin, and I'll just make my spirals wider and wider and wider. And uh, that way you can be confident that you're not missing too much and that you're able to um, uh, give space when you need to skip over some. So be methodical. Be methodical with your harvesting. Think about it. Sometimes I'll do the spiral. Sometimes I'll do the spokes, where I go out and pick and I come back empty. Go out, pick, come back, pick empty. But you want, you want to be picking at every step as much as possible. So how to do that? Scout well. Scout well. 70% of the time it's not going to be worth it to go to a patch that's meh. You know, maybe if you're working with Lupin where you're getting paid $67 a pound, it pays off. Um, but usually it's, it pays off to take the time to find a good patch. Take another day to find a good patch and work that one rather than saying, oh, there's some red stem seed so you know I'll just get it. Because you just got so much in between time. Like a carpenter friend of mine said, you put down your tool all the time, stop putting down your tool. How can you, how can you keep the hammer in your hand as much as possible? You know, don't set it down and get back in your car and unload your berries and pack up your gear and then drive somewhere else. Just stay in your car until you find a good place that'll work. Um, forest service roads, work, work the logging roads. Because you, usually if you're getting more than a three quarters of a mile from your car, unless it's a really solid patch, maybe if you're doing something light like looping, it's all right. But when you're working with berries and you're toting 50 pound bags of berries, you don't want to get too far from your rig. Uh, so that's a, a good consideration. Uh, yeah, yeah, bear grass is different whatnot. But so let me show you who's uh, who feels like being a tree. I need a tree, tree. All right, there's my tree. Give me some branches. So uh, this device, you want to pinch the branches because otherwise they'll just they'll be all over and you, you won't be able to keep, uh, keep a good hold of them. Go higher. <laughs> so you reach up and watch how it as you bring the angle, it pinches, right? And now now pull some tension against it. Normally it's up higher, but uh, so now you have. <laughs> So, so now you have both hands free. I don't know if you can see it, but I'm standing on a rope down here. The tension of the branch is holding that stick in place. The, the branch is now fixed in front of me. You can put down your right hand. 
<laughs> we already harvested that one. <laughs> so, uh, so now it's all floating over over you. So either you're working it by hands with your slidey gloves, right? Not your knit gloves, your slidey gloves, or else you're right, open up free both your hands. So something of this nature is important. Uh, like I said, you can do it. Thank you. You're a wonderful tree. If you could be a, a shrub, what kind of shrub? What kind of shrub are you? What kind of shrub are you? Yeah, I take you for a service for a guy. Um, so if you put a bicycle hook on, try and get the angle. The angle helps because you can still sort of pinch. Uh, but that's important. The other style that we like to work with, and this works better for more kind of branchy species, like, I don't know, choke cherry, I guess, is pretty good. Uh, a red stem ceanothus. But this one you actually corkscrew on. You grab it like that, kind of pull it down, and then you corkscrew it on, and then it usually locks against the branches. And this one's designed to do like that, so you can pull it back if you need and get those things that are really deep in there. But same, same theory, you got the rope on the bottom that frees up both of your hands. So again, innovation is your advantage, whatever you can come up with. And that's, I think, in a lot of ways, this is like a process of remembering how to be indigenous, remembering how to be a human, and, and the difference between being able to pick 200 berries in a day versus 100 berries when that's your food, that makes a difference, you know, and, and it requires knowing your tools, knowing the plant and how to work with it to pull it off. So get, get the mind working. Um, so central bin is key. Some sort of hopper that you wear is key, uh, be it tree planting bags, and uh, a branch grabber is key. I think there's a lot more we could probably talk about, but we're getting uh, we're getting close to being at the end here. So I guess I, I do want to do this. Uh, these are this is what you're picking into. And we always carry a lot of these, so they're reusable. We use them over and over. But it allows the berries to breathe. That's really important. You don't wanna, you don't wanna ever keep them closed because then they'll heat up and the heat will damage the seeds. So keep them open, let them breathe. Air can get through on the outside. Damaged berries are okay. They're supposed to be smushed. The acids and whatnot actually improve the germination rate generally. So you're not picking, you're not picking to, for jam. You know, you're not picking for frozen berries. You can be rough, it's all right. Uh, but these are, the seat, these are the bags you need. If you're working with very juicy stuff, then it's good to have a, like buffalo berry, it's good to have a uh, garbage sack, the plastic, some sort of plastic sack, and then stuff it inside, um, stuff it inside a burlap sack or else you could stuff it in here. And that way you're retaining your juices because you're getting paid by the pound for your berries. So every, every ounce of juice you lose is a dollar, right? And uh, so you, you retain your weight by having a plastic bag in there. It's going to be getting anaerobic quick, so if you can, smudge it around if you're out picking for five days. Mix it around and keep it open. Keep it in the shade, always in the shade, always on the north side of something. Always, always, always in the shade. Uh, don't let them heat up. Uh, you're responsible for delivering. If it's a, a large, if it's a large amount, then we will uh, talk to us and we can help you out, uh, figure out some scenario. Sometimes we organize group picks, but generally you're out on your own. It's usually funner to pick with people, but it's usually less lucrative, so you got to balance that. Um, but we will organize group picks from time to time. We're organizing a big group pick at the beginning of May for balsam root. It's a good, easy, safe one for people to get into and get their feet wet and realize what it's like to work with us and just get out there. So May 5th, we'll be doing that. It'll be uh, west of Missoula. I won't give out any more details. But uh, yeah, reach out to me if you're interested. The contact information is there. We're in the process of harvesting a lot of knowledge and a lot of practices from people who have been doing this for a long time. And there's a whole generation of folks who have been integrated with the landscape uh, that are retiring, you know, we all get old and uh, the reality is that my generation, there's not a lot of us who are equipped with very practical skills or are very familiar with the woods unless it's in a recreational sense 
And I'm trying to break that dichotomy. Like I want people to become humans again. I want people to be a part of the landscape. And this is an economically viable way to enable that. So we got to transfer that knowledge, their practices, their locations over to the willing participants so that we can enable a generation of land revitalization for the future earth keepers. Thank you. All right. Questions? You have a favorite thing to harvest? I like I like dogwood. I like dogwood because there's usually a lot of birds, and uh, it's usually in pretty wet settings. And wet settings are very interesting to me. Always wear muck boots boots when you're harvesting dogwood. Um, uh, yeah, soggy feet. Uh, yeah, they're just fun. I like I like reaching for them. I I I, I love being in red. Thickets, I find that beautiful. Uh, they smell. It's just a very good smell. Uh, and that generally, you're getting six percent. If you have 100 pounds of seed, 100 pounds of berry, six percent of that is about going to be seeds, almost across the board. Uh, not with rose hips and not with dogwood. And so dogwood is nice because that's somewhere around 15 to 18. So you feel like, yeah, <laughs> you know. And so that's fun. And we can sell as much dogwood as people can pick, a lot. And uh, yeah. I love dogwood. I also love service berries. I always make a batch of pemmican when I'm doing service berry. And a little known thing that is important to know when you're making pemmican, you don't just use lard. A lot of people try and use lard to make pemmican, but it'll go rancid. It won't store. Lard is not meant to be used like that. You don't just mix it with fat. You need the, uh, the kidney fat. It's a very specific kind of fat. Uh, what do they call it? Suet. True suet. If you go to a butcher and say, give me some suet, usually they'll give you some muscle fat, but that's not suet. Suet is the kidney fat. It's usually right there. And um, it, it's it's full of kind of sinewy material, and it's yellow, and it goes like when you tear it apart. So you want to use that when you're making pemmican. And uh, a lot of times choke cherry was used for pemmican, but that's got pits, and even if you crush it, you, you're hurting teeth. But service berry is the perfect pemmican food. So, yeah. uh, What's that? Um, friends is where I get it, but uh, that uh, no Lower Valley. Whoever said it, yeah, yeah. Lower Valley. They they sometimes have it, but my friends, I like get it from them. Let's see what else questions. Feed me. I can keep going. How do you make sure you're not collecting so much that? It's based on every plant for sure. That's a big element of it. But usually, by the way you feel, you can tell. You can tell when you're like, oh, I'm getting a little rapey, you know. And it's a very distinct feeling. And uh, the way you feel is is the best indicator I could offer you. You know, we know what ethical is. If we're sitting in this room, we care about plants. You know what ethical is. But like I said, I'll try and leave a quarter to a third. Uh, I just make sure to remember to skip. Work, 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 skip. Oh, yeah, I got to skip. Work, 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 skip. Never hit the patches. Um, yeah. And with things like rose hips, usually there's always rose hips that are three years old still remaining on a bush. So that's a lot of times that's not too too much of an issue there. Sir, on your hand up. Yep. On the back where it's uh, tables. Yep. On the far right hand column. By that it, it does really well in very dry situations. That's usually it growing uh, or where it's found, yeah. But usually uh, that's a highly sought after species that can grow in dr dry conditions because a lot of these are for reclamation. And so if you think about reclamation, usually that means that the ecosystem is not intact. So it's probably going to be getting a lot of light. It's probably going to be get getting a lot of wind. And it probably doesn't have any ground cover or organic matter to keep soil in the water. So if something can exist and uh, can succeed in a dry land setting, it's usually very appealing. I think you just answered my second question. You, you, you buy the seeds. Hmm? You're using these seeds for reclamation. We, we provide them. So this is, let me paint this image. Pickers are very important. The, the native seed business for, for reclamation is billions of dollars. It is billions of dollars. You wouldn't believe the amounts of money that people pass around for this, right? And so in our experience, this is basically, um, this is about what it looks like. Uh, so this top layer is people who are doing doing contract work to get the seeds into the landscape, hydro seeders, 
uh, restoration companies, right? And then this chunk is uh, is nurseries, usually wholesale nurseries. That's mostly who we do with people who are buying five to twenty-five pounds of hey Rod of uh, seeds at a time. And then this is seed brokers, and this is the biggest chunk. So they're the people who are making the most money, and all they're doing is shuffling seeds. I mean, granted, they do provide a service. They are doing mixing. They are help felt sourcing things and compiling them, and that's very valuable. But the smallest portion is the pickers. And without this piece, all the other stuff disappears, right? And so, oh. and, um, and this is kind of on the brink of disappearing. I mean, there's some of it out there, but really it's fading out. And it's really important that people get back into the woods if we want all of this to exist. And all of this equals intact ecosystems. All of this, for example, uh, uh, one of the reasons why there's a lot of thunderstorms in August is because that's when a lot of pines are producing pollen, right? So on ridge lines, you have pines that the wind's coming through, it's sweeping up all that pollen, it's bringing it high up into the atmosphere, all that pollen provides surface area for condensation to take place on. You have all this condensation taking place, those start rubbing together and you get thunderstorms, right? Pollen equals thunder. And those are like the realities that we're starting to understand about the intricacy of these ecosystems. And um, without seed collectors, the ability to make weather is gonna, or to, to affect climate by planting ecosystems is, is less accessible. Is it Folsom now? Huh? Are you delivering in Folsom now? Or we kind of have multiple sites. I'm moving to North Idaho. That's where there's the best picking, and I got a lot of good facilities there. Um, but Hot Springs will be a delivery point, and uh, probably have something uh, in uh, um, uh, Kyla. Okay, and then. Uh, okay, elderberries like uh, uh, sub irrigation. They always like having access to water. So if you're near a spring, you're going to have a good bet. Um, uh, or if you're in a uh, small valley that is has a pinch at the outflow point, then usually there's like a subterranean lake in there, and the elderberry is going to do pretty well. Um, one of the best patches, which I'll share openly, is uh, mile marker 31. I think, east of Missoula. Uh, what's that, Nimrod? Nimrod Hot Springs. Good choke cherry, good elderberry. Rollins. Rollins is a good example. Don't pick there because it's on the reservation, but it's a good I example to illustrate that pinch point in the subterranean lake. There's. You were saying uh, you can pick old seeds. I mean, if you know what your plants are and whatever, because there's still good seeds, if there's dry berries or there's dry rose hips, that's suitable uh, uh, not, not, not for us, no. Field. Field. That all comes from the field. Like, for example, service berry, you want to pick them when the middle section of them is purple, but the very tip of the chain of berries is green. You know, and it would take a while to relay all that, and, and it's just field. But really, you get out there and you pick it, and we'll, chances are, we'll take it and then give you feedback. That's how it works usually. And then how do you sign up to do these group things you're going to do? Even though you're not going to get a lot. Contact me. Oh, and this you'll get a lot. In the balsam pick, you'll get a lot. There's, uh, so balsam goes to mining reclamation primarily. So there's uh, a huge need for that. I mean, we're, we have to gather 3,000 pounds of seed for balsam root this year. And uh, we, we make our rates so that people get paid. If, if Again, this is if you're refined, if you're experienced, if you know where to go, if, if you have your processes down. We, we have our rates so that people are making between $100 and $250 a day. Like we have some, this one guy who will go out and he'll pick, he'll spend the morning picking rose hips, he'll make $400, he'll cook it for the afternoon, and he'll do that for a few weeks on end, right? Um, but you have to know where you're going, you have to know what you're doing. So if you want to get into it, it might be good to start as a hobby and then dive into it, or if you know your landscapes and you know where these patches are, just make a leap. But either way, just get experience under your boots. That's the best way to start. And we like to support you as much as we can. Any others? I'll go until they kick us out. Back to land restoration. Uh-huh. Those are the people that are restoring the land are the ones buying the seeds, correct? Not usually. The ones buying the seeds are the ones who are selling it to the people who are growing the plants to do the restoration or the ones who are uh, planting it themselves. Most money comes from the federal sector and then there's some uh, individual private landowners who then usually use supplementary 
uh, funds from state or federal entities or even uh, NGO entities to enable it. And then there's some just uh, wealthy people who do it. And then there's some very dedicated people who don't have a lot of money, but they prioritize it. You know, you, you see the gamut, but I think it's the responsibility of all of us in some way to participate in that revitalization process. Good job, thank you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and if uh, I got to point out this fella here. If people don't know Rod McGeever, he has uh, one of the most extensive Apple knowledges of anyone I know. He has an incredible Apple uh, gene bank, and uh, his knowledge about Arbor... Arborous, arborism is incredible, and uh, and we have uh, we have another leader up here who helps uh, guide the tribes on proper management. So I know everyone here has their specialty, and and when you put it all in a pile, this is this is probably I don't know what 500 years of experience sitting in one room. That's imagine if you took all the Grizz games and you took that's got to be like. 20,000 years of experience at least. And if you, you could focalize that on something like this, boy, you could change the world in a heartbeat. <laughs> but it's all a matter of priority, you know? <laughs> but hey, 30 is good. <laughs> yep. What do you call that little thumb thing? Uh, uh, twine knife, I think is what they call it. Grapefruit knife, it's used for grapefruit. Do you have any resources that, you know, good places to get, like... A&M, or Leonard, A&M Leonard, no. I think. They're pretty good. And me. <laughs> yep. Jeff Moore, Canvas. Yeah, whoever wants one, they're right here. Did you want... You, oh, you wanted it. There you go. Um, let's see. Oh, Bunchberry Dogwood. That's a... F that's a great one. It's ten dollars a, a pound, and interestingly enough, we sell it all to Germany. Yeah, uh, we sell it for yeah. So that's that's fun. There's a lot of one. Everyone has their own favorite species, and they have them for a reason. Whether it's when it's ready or how it is to pick, but you know, everyone develops their preferences. So you don't have to do it all. You can just do one species and and love it. You know, it's better to do only what you love and do it well than do a little bit of all and have it be crappy. No. Uh. What are the Germans doing? Uh, I think it's mostly going to ornamental stuff, but it's absolutely limitless. Thank you, everyone.